Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Oh, creator God, we give you thanks for gathering us here into this amazing community, reminding us that each one of us have a story and each one of us are part of your unfolding story. We ask that you continue to empower us with the presence of your Holy Spirit, that you give us the strength that we may see and be and make love happen in the now of our action, here in this place, out in our communities, in our lives, and in the world. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It is always a joy as we come together to worship and celebrate this God who is love, who lives in us and through us and among us. And it is also a joy that when we come together, we know that sometimes there are first-time visitors who are present with us. Do we have any first-time visitors today, people who are new to the community? Um, please raise your hand so that we can say welcome. Welcome to you. Welcome. Welcome. And it is also a joy as we gather together that at our 11 o'clock service, um, we are broadcasting live to people around the world. And so we say thank you for tuning in. Um, we do apologize for the technical difficulties that we had last week. We have actually got them all worked out. And so thank you for joining us once more and being with us as we worship. We do encourage you at some point during the worship service to scroll down at the bottom of the screen where you see this broadcast 
you will find that there's a place where you can enter in um, some of your information. You can also give us your prayers. Let us know how we can be present with you and support you spiritually wherever you are on your life journey, your spiritual journey, or located throughout the world. And to all who are here today, I do encourage you um, to take a moment, um, if you haven't done so already, to silence your cell phone, um, to check in and let people know that you're here, um, to let people know what your aha moments are um, um, during worship, um, and um, also then to rise as you're able, to greet those who are near you, and to let everybody know that they're in the right place this morning. Good morning. Love you, love you, love you. So good to see you. And I like the hat. How are you? Great. Good to see you again. And peace to you. Good morning to see you. This morning is taken from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, beginning at the 38th verse. You've heard the commandment, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, offer no resistance whatsoever when you're confronted by violence. When someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn and offer the other. If anyone wants to sue you for your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go two miles, go the extra mile. Give, though, give to those who beg from you. Hear what the Spirit says today.
Amen. Please be seated. Yes, God. Amen. Amen. That is what this story is all about. It's about the transformative power of God's love to take sorrow and turn it into joy, to take these challenging times, these oppressive times, and to somehow, with the turn of a phrase, the flick of a head, to transform that into the very moment, the very time, the very means of liberation. We believe in the God who is love. We believe that each one of us is created in the image of the God who is love. So God's love is there for us. It lives in us. It lives through us. And sometimes, though, on this journey, the stories we've inherited, the tapes that run in our heads, the experiences that we have in the world, it doesn't feel like those sorrows are being trans transformed into joys. And it certainly doesn't feel like oppression has been, has been eliminated or liberation is coming our way. There's more to this story, I promise you. Because <laughs> you know there has to be. So, so let me begin here. So, so a couple of years ago, um, when I was up in Toronto, I started working with the Children and Families Ministry that we had up there, and we were planning for our annual blessing of the animals, which happens usually the beginning of October. And so I met with the families, and we got together in our big social hall around all these different tables, and we talked a little bit um, with the families, with the children, with the parents, um, about why it is that we do the blessing of animals. We talked a little about Noah's Ark. And then on all of the different tables, there were these posters and all these crafty kind of things, and there were markers and crayons and whatever else was there. And we invited um, the parents, the children, to take what they could and to help us celebrate and to promote the blessing of the animals, for them to actually fully participate in this event. And so the older kids grabbed it and they started creating posters to advertise. And for the younger kids, what we said was, you know what, if you just want to, ju just create a poster of whatever your favorite animal is, whatever it is. And, and I barely got the, the last syllable of the word animal out of my lips when all of a sudden, like from across the darkened social hall, this small little tiny hand like just like darts up as high as she could make it go. And, and I said, yeah, Julie, like what's up? And she said, like any animal, really? And I said, <laughs> yeah, anyone, no, anyone, re yeah, whatever your favorite one is. And she's like, all right, wow. And her hand goes down and she uses that hand and all her strength in order to give her leverage so she can reach across the table and gather up like all of the markers and the crayons and the crafty <laughs> things that she needs for whatever this amazing thing is that's going on in her head. And, and you know what that's like? Like for four and five-year-olds, um, they just, they have this, 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 this way of, of looking and seeing the world. It's like this amazing wide-eyed wonder where anything is possible. And I have no idea what's going on in her little tiny head, but my goodness, her eyes are so big, it just draws everybody in. It's the kind of wonder which, which I just wish I could just tap every so often for a little while. Um, but, but, but that's it. And so, so, Chatter fills the hall, and, and I just kind of move my way around, and I'm talking to each of the different families and, and exploring with the kids what they're actually doing so they can tell their story. When all of us just kind of like breathe in a little bit more deeply because we hear from the other side of the room, right where that little girl was, we hear, we hear, that's stupid. No, sir, it isn't. It's not even real. Oh, yes, it is. I have no idea what's going on at the moment, but everybody kind of wants to heads down and forget about it. And so we hear her mommy, I kind of make my, we hear her mommy kind of intervene and separate them out, and, and, and I can hear her talking to, to the older brother saying, okay, now apologize to your sister. Apologize, for whatever, apologize to your sister. And, 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 and as he does, like so many of us does, he clenches up his fist and he clenches up his teeth and he apologizes through that, that, that clenched jaw. I'm sorry, he says, like he really meant it. And... <laughs> And, and then, and then, what does mommy do? Well, mommy does the next best thing. She turns to her little girl and she says, okay, now forgive him and turn the other cheek. Isn't this what we say? And what does she do? She does, she does the cleverest thing. She says, okay, she smiles at him, nods, and then she literally 
turns the other cheek, away from her brother, heads down, and focuses on whatever it is that has occupied her mind and her time and her spirit. And I think, oh my gosh, is that not a metaphor for for life right now? We've lost our ability to be able to have conversation or engage people who think different things or believe different things, believe what is or isn't real. We sit there in judgment telling everybody else that maybe their idea, their thought, their drawing, whatever it is, is stupid. And our only response when we receive it is what? No, sir. Like, we're yelling at each other back and forth like this is going to solve anything. And even if somebody summons up the courage to sort of apologize and say they're sorry, we turn the other cheek and look the other way, and nothing is resolved and no relationships are reconciled, and we just kind of go in the whole other direction. Now, here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. How many of you, how many of you here grew up listening to the words of Jesus, the one that we're supposed to be following, the one who actually tells us that we're supposed to love ourselves and love one another, this very text that we talked about this morning? How many of you received some sort of an interpretation, an understanding that that's exactly what we're supposed to do? We're not supposed to resist evil. We're supposed to just turn the other cheek when somebody does us wrong. Isn't that what we've been told? Where is there room for love in that? Where is there any justice in that? How do we reconcile any of the violence that's going on in the world? How does this reconcile with that God who's love, who creates each of us to be loved, who calls us to actually love ourselves enough that we're not actually supposed to just lie there and take it. And yet, this is the interpretation that we've got, isn't it? There's more to this story. For better or worse, we live on this side, on this side of a whole lot of work and a whole lot of translations. Translations and interpretations of Scripture, which often are done by particular people with particular views in order to keep, quite frankly, other particular people in their place. This is reality. This is reality. When, when the earliest translations found their way into English, this particular text actually got translated as don't resist don't resist. And these texts, quite frankly, have been used and abused in order to keep people in their place. Abused spouses, the lower classes, the people who we didn't like, the people from different countries, the people who believe different things. This is the reality of part of our spiritual inheritance. But ours, ours is the job in order to go back and recover what is the essence of the God who is love. Part of the way that I understand Scripture is this. Any reading of any text, I don't care what language you're in, I don't care what version of the Bible that you're using, if you read the Scriptures, and we believe that God is the God who is love, if we believe that God calls us over and over and over again to love ourselves, to love one another, to love neighbor, to love stranger, to love enemy, and if we believe the word of the prophets, that our job is to love to be kind, to do justice, and to walk humbly, any and every interpretation of Scripture must meet that that test. If I come up with a reading that is not loving to myself and others, if I come up with a reading that makes it just us and not justice, there's a problem in that. If I'm reading and interpreting the text in order to hold myself up and keep my people separated, because we're the good ones, of course, there's a problem in that. Here's the reality. If we go back to the ancient texts, the actual language that was used in this moment, the Greek, the biblical Greek that was used in this particular text, what Jesus is actually saying, the word that is actually used, is a word that is used in a very particular kind of circumstance. The word, even in the Bible itself, every other example in the Bible itself, when you use this particular word, it is used to describe what it is like when one approaching army confronts another approaching army. It's about doing battle. It's about meeting violence with violence. What Jesus says is we are called not to meet violence with violence. We are called not to meet evil with evil. That whole idea about not resisting is actually about not engaging in violence. It's exactly the kind of thing that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was saying. 
Violence does not get anything other than violence. Only love, only the way of love can undo the power of violence in our world. And so, in the 1990s in Bogota, Colombia, the city was teetering on the brink of total chaos. Violence was absolutely crazy. It was out of control. Traffic was absolutely crazy and out of control. There were thousands of pedestrian deaths because people were just like crossing the street, not paying attention to anything. And even if they stopped and they waited for the traffic signals, they'd get run over because people just didn't bother to pay attention to any of the traffic signals. And so in the midst of all that chaos, in the midst of all of that violence, the people elected a new mayor. It turns out that what brought him to prominence was because of his antics and his tactics were so off the wall that people actually saw through them and saw in him authenticity and honesty and somebody who actually lived by the way of true principles, which was so different than all of the corruption that they were facing in their police and in their politicians. And so they elected him. He was a former college professor. And immediately after getting elected, one of the first things that he did was he created a character. He called it Super Citizen. He himself put on a cape and put on a mask. And he like, made a total mockery of himself in order to encourage people and to let them know that they too had the same power that he had in order to take control and make that community what it was that they had most desired. In order to try to start to combat the violence, he created what he called a vaccine against violence. He didn't hire more police. He didn't build some kind of a wall. He didn't berate a whole bunch of other different people. What he did was he invited people to gather in the city square and to blow up these balloons and to draw pictures of the people who had done them harm. The spouses who abused one another, the people who had done violence to children, the drug lords, the cartels, the people who had robbed indiscriminately. He invited them to draw pictures, and so they gathered. 50,000 people in the city gathered in that square. They blew up these balloons, and then simultaneously, in a shared experience, they popped them as a sign and a signal to say, your violence can do me no harm anymore. And then, to try to get control over this crazy traffic situation that was killing people in their cars and pedestrians on the sea, on the street. He talked to people, and over and over and over again, most people pointed and blamed the taxi drivers as the big culprits of all the problem. And so what did he do? He put a call out to all the citizens, and he said, I want you to call my office, and I want you to report taxi drivers who you think are the best drivers in the city. Not what you're thinking, huh? <laughs> and he says, in less than a couple of weeks, he got over 150 phone calls. And he gathered all of those taxi drivers whose citizens had said were the best drivers in the city. And he gathered them together, and they started to explore the question and the issue. And of course, it was much more complicated than pointing it to one group of people. And so he started to engage them. And those taxi drivers went and had conversations with other taxi drivers to wonder what could they do to make the streets safer. He actually ended up creating them, and he called them the Night of the Zebras. It was this order of the realm of the city, like totally fictitious and totally made up. But in playing, he says, it opens people up to start to think about their world in different terms. They got together and they painted 1,500 stars on the streets, one in every single place where a pedestrian had been killed by a vehicle in the last year. And then, and then, um, he hired 20 mimes um, who would follow people around the street, and when they were walking through the streets and not paying attention, they mocked each of the citizens um, <laughs> and, right, and totally played um, for what they were doing. That's what I was looking for. And then he did this. He handed out 350,000 little signs, and on one side, they had a green thumbs up, and on the other, they had a red thumbs down. And he gave the simple instruction 
He wanted everybody in the country to stand wherever they were when they were passing by, walking on the sidewalk, standing at intersections, waiting to cross the street, waiting until the light turned across the street, to use their little signs in order to judge how drivers were driving. <laughs> Immediately it worked. Traffic de deaths were cut by half in less than a year. Traffic fatalities due to pedestrian crossings were cut by more than a half over the period of a couple. It worked. What he says is this. He says, laughter, art, and symbols, they break down barriers. They disarm extreme skepticism. And it makes it safe to begin listening and talking with one another, to actually start having conversa conversations that we otherwise would be afraid to have. Humor, metaphors, and stories create these moments of shared experience that then give us the opportunity to go deeper and further with one another. All of these signs and symbols had a point. It wasn't about being silly for the sake of being silly. It was being silly in a way that was seriously funny. <laughs> and for me, for me, this is precisely what Jesus does throughout his life and throughout his ministry. It's exactly and precisely what I think God was doing. Is not the biggest joke on humanity that when Jesus dies on the cross and man thinks that he has the last word, and I mean man as in men because, well, those were the people who were in power. We can say humanity, but in this instance, I actually mean men. <laughs> when men thought that they had the last word because they tried to contain and control God's liberating love and they put Jesus up on the cross, God has the last laugh because God resurrects, because God's liberating love cannot be oppressed, cannot be snuffed out, and cannot be killed. Jesus, throughout his life, tells stories in order to create the context that lets us come in, lets us engage in ways that we otherwise wouldn't. And if we go back and we take a look at the three examples that he gives in this small little piece of scripture that we talked about this morning, let's talk about that. Turn the other cheek. Turning the other cheek wasn't about just completely ignoring somebody who just disagreed you. It's actually the complete opposite. What well, we know from the culture at the time, that what Jesus is actually talking about here is a situation where somebody who had greater power, higher authority, higher status, would demonstrate that they were in control and had a higher authority by shaming another. They would give them the backhand of the right the right hand against the right cheek. Now, what we also know from that culture is that when you turn the other cheek, they couldn't do the same with the left hand because in that culture, the left hand was used for all kinds of unclean things. And if somebody used the left hand in order to touch a person, shame was actually brought on the person who was doing the touching. And so if the whole point of the exercise was to shame and put somebody in place, then what we understand is that to turn the other cheek would be to actually put that person who was put down in a position where the only way for the person doing the striking could strike back would be with a fist against the left cheek. But here's the thing. In that culture, the only way that you could strike somebody who you considered to be your peer would be with a fist, not with the back of the hand. And so what Jesus does in this very simple story, in this one verse of text, he empowers people who are being pushed down. He overturns the power structure because what it does is it puts the adversary in a position of having to actually acknowledge the one that they wanted to think was lower than them in their full humanity as their equal. And it totally throws off balance the people who think that they are in control and that they have all the power. Is that just not amazing? This isn't about just like being the doormat. You know, this is one of my challenges. I don't know. I don't know when, when, when the gospel of Jesus and the call to love one another actually became like the doctrine of being a doormat. It's just not there, and it's just not true, and that's not loving, and that's not just. And so then he goes on, and he talks about the shirt off your back. And so there's this situation. You go to the court, and somebody wants to take your shirt off your back. 
Well, who would that be? Well, it'd be somebody else who had no other assets, no other resources. We're talking about the poorest of the poor within that society. And what Jesus says is, if they come and they want to take your tunic, it's not just your shirt, it's basically all of your inner garments. These are like, like, like your clothes, the closest things that touch your body. And, 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 and it was possible if you were in debt to somebody for them to actually claim that, if that was all that you had left. And what Jesus says is, don't only give them that, give them your outer coat as well. Why does Jesus do that? Here's why. Because to do that would actually render you completely naked. It was to lampoon and show the total injustice of a system that would claim the very last possessions of the people who are most impoverished and pushed down by a society. It does the exact same thing as the first story does, and it does what I think God is always doing in us and through us. It is overturning the power of those who think that they are the most powerful. It is raising up and empowering the people who think they have nothing and are nothing and are treated like nothing within society. And then, to go the extra mile, that's a very specific situation that happened when the occupying forces, the Romans who were occupying that land, they could press citizens into service, but they were limited and restricted of only going and requiring one mile of service. To require anything more would bring shame and harm and punishment on the soldier. And so when Jesus says, if you're pressed into service, offer to go the second mile, it is actually to put that person in power off balance because they would not actually require you to even go the one mile out of the threat that they may actually get in trouble for requesting you to go too. What Jesus is doing is overturning, using the systems of power with a slight turn of the words and a slight turn of the head in order to empower the people who were just put down. This, for me, is exactly what it means to engage in nonviolent resistance. It's exactly what it means to live this call to be love. Love is, and nonviolent resistance is not just something that we do when it's convenient because there are people in power and policies that we don't like. Nonviolence is the way, the way that we live the message of love. The mayor, the mayor says that the most effective campaigns that he found were those that focused on changing hearts and minds, not through preaching, not through legislation, not through policy, not through threats, not through violence, but through artistically creative strategies that employ the power and participation of individuals in the community to embrace their values, regulate their own behaviors, and uphold their own principles. It's like you need to treat community as though it's community and adults as though they're adults. That's what he's saying. And so I believe that what we really find with Jesus and, and everything else that we know is that life is like this great blank canvas that we're all invited in order to use whatever artistic gifts that we've been given, whether it's to write our stories or to paint our lives or to create whatever it is so that love is made real in however way, whatever way we think it can be possible. And so that brings me back to our drawings in the mom. And as I approach to see what her daughter has drawn on the piece of paper, the mom kind of embarrassingly looks down, having had the earlier conflict. And she says, well, you know, I tried to get her to draw something that was normal, <laughs> apologetically. And my eyes move over to see what's on the table. And there, and there, what this young girl has done is she has created this wonderful, beautiful scene. There are these rainbow stars in this purpley sky with this orange tree that's like growing up the side of the sheet. And there, front and center with the grassy hills in the background is this beautiful pink and white unicorn. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. And there's like this big snout with all these little marks that show how sparkly and shiny that horn must be. And the mom, like, is embarrassed about this whole thing. And before I can say anything, the young girl, she looks at me and she goes, it's a unicorn! Like, I could miss it, right? <laughs> and then I say, and I smile, and I look at her, and I say to the mom, with the daughter and her brother listening, I said, did you know then in the earliest English translation, the King James Bible, there are more than six references to unicorns. It is true. When they translated from Latin and Greek, they took the word uni, 
horn, one horn, which probably meant a rhinoceros, but they didn't know. And so what they created was they literally translated it into unicorn. There are psalms that talk about how God's strength is like that of a unicorn. To which the young girl rises up in her seat, the mom kind of smiles, and her brother sinks down just an inch <laughs> or two. This is the power of nonviolence. With the turn of a phrase and the twist of a head, the act that was meant to disparage actually lifts up and empowers. This is our story. From the very beginning, the story of this congregation has been the story of nonviolent resistance. The seeds of this very congregation began when police tried to arrest and embarrass a bunch of people who were at a club in Long Beach. Their only crime was dancing with men. And the bar owner said after the raid, called out and said, I know there are florists in here, go and gather up and we're going to meet these people down at, the, down at the police station. And so they arrived when the people were bailed out and the club owner bailed them out. When the people were bailed out from that, they were all presented with these bouquets of flowers. This act that was meant to disparage was actually turned into a celebration of the heroic victory of these people who were arrested for the cause. That act is what planted in Troy's mind the seed to begin this congregation and this movement. During the AIDS years, it was the protest for ACT UP, all of the staged performance actions that actually broke the silence of a community in a city and a government that refused to speak the truth. It was when the church burned down, when our prior church burned down to the ground, it was the choice to hold worship service and for the choir to sing out in the middle of the street that turned a fundamental act of violence that was meant to push us forever in the closet that gave freedom and liberation ever more. This, my friends, is our story. And I believe that we live in this time where we need to go back and recover the story, recover the creative power of nonviolent resistance. You know, our, 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 our theology and our worship and our behaviors used to be like fierce and fabulous, and they've become beige and boring. And I just believe that our walls... Our walls need to talk. We need to go back and do cutting-edge theology once more. We need to go back and figure out how is it that we recover the best of our heritage and the best of our history, and that we use that in order to motivate and to share and to tell and to inspire courageous dreams and courageous stories once more. I ask that God blesses us on this journey and that you find it within you to reclaim the holy creative spirit that the God has planted within you that we may be fierce and fabulous and out on the streets once more. Amen. We have a very special treat as our sermon response. Sarah and her daughter Karenza are going to, Sarah's going to sing and her daughter Karenza is going to draw for us inspired by that song. Go. 
soul's wings and not get weary in well doing. As we walk on, we walk on, we walk on. Yeah, we walk on. Saw you in Selma, you poured out your blood, you labored in love on bended knee in the name of freedom. Your hands are dirty, but your soul is clean. On and on you bring the ways of peace under clouds of fiery steams. And walk on, and walk on, and walk on. this part we sing come by here my lord come by here come by here my lord come by here come by here my lord come by I do encourage you, uh, for, for those who are here, to um, either during communion or, or shortly after worship service, um, to stop by and um, take a look at the beautiful drawing that Carenza has just created. Um, it is a picture of the world with the peace symbol in it. It is absolutely beautiful. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Carenza, um, for blessing us with that. For all of those who are worshiping with us online, again, thank you for joining us, and I do encourage you and invite you at this time to um, take a moment to gather up whatever the elements that you have on hand that you would like to use for communion, whether it's grape juice and wine or crackers and bread or whatever that you have. Um, having that available will make sure that you're able to fully participate in our open communion, which we will be celebrating in just a few minutes. I do encourage everybody, as I do every Sunday, 
to take your worship bulletin, which doubles as a newsletter. There are lots of different things that are happening in the life of the community, lots of different events and activities for you to get involved in, not just in, but after worship as well. I just want to highlight a, a very, very um, few. Um, so the, um, on February 11th, which is this coming Saturday, um, it is Valentine's Day weekend, and so um, we are joining with um, our friends from the 130 service, and there is going to be a Valentine's Day celebration. Um, it's a $10 suggested donation. Um, it's a time for fun. There will be food and entertainment. There will be dancing. Um, so we do encourage you to come on out and celebrate this night of love. Um, there's information, again, in your worship bulletin about that. Um, next Sunday, on Sunday, February 12th, following this worship service, we are going to have a special meeting for anybody and everybody who's interested in justice in whatever its many different forms that it may be. There are some who are already involved in our justice ministry. You may be sitting there wanting to get more involved in the justice ministry. And so next Sunday, following the 11 o'clock worship service, we will be holding a meeting um, in the room right behind us in the Ryland Room so that we can actually explore what this ministry looks like and how do we get more organized around um, being that presence of hope and a nonviolent presence um, in this um, sometimes too often violent world. So please stop in. You can also see, send an email to justice at mccla.org if you're not able to make that, that ministry or you have ideas and suggestions. Um, and um, speaking of justice, our volunteer of the week um, is the Justice Ministry, which has been led by Pastor um, Lucia, uh, Lucia Chappelle, who is um, not with us today, um, but she has for the last several years um, been an active presence in keeping us connected to a number of organizations. So when you do see her, please thank her for that ministry um, and let her know if you want to join in um, on that. We do need your resources and we do need your help, as I always say every single Sunday, um, so that we may have the resources so that we can be this vibrant community, that we can continue to transform lives, that we can continue to be the voice of hope, doing incredible work within our world. And so we ask that you give. Give as God is blessing you. Give as you are able so that together we can do amazing things.
And that's our prayer, God. That's our prayer. Greater things are still to come in the city. And so we bless these offerings, knowing that they have a physical appearance of one bowl. But as they multiply and they expand, we just know they'll continue to do great work through this church, through these people. In your many names I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing about the appearance of things. You see, when I came to church today, hobbling in, a little scar on my face and all those kind of things, wearing my red, yes, to tell you what team I'm thinking of after church. <laughs> There's a reality that says there's a blessing, an unexpected blessing. And as I sat there, there's a celebration come. Had I not come to church today, I would not have had the privilege of co-consecrating with my sister in Christ, Reverend Barbara Haynes, and to be with all of you. There's an unexpected things when God rearranges things for the greater good. You see, I'm honored on that experience. Amen. And so I feel that presence. And so, yeah, I have a little, little, little swag on it, but I know <laughs> that our God is a healer. All right. And so for whatever it's used for, whatever what the need was for me, I'm just honored to be here. So I invite you to pray with me. And I invite you for just a moment to go into the silence of the space. And whatever is on your mind, whatever is in on your heart that is weighing you down, there have been so many distractions in our world. I invite you for this moment to take a moment of silence and offer your prayers to our God. Holy One, the God of this many names, and I know that my words just really don't really specify or define you or to really name you, but I just thank you. God, I've loved you all of my life. We have loved you all of our collective lives, in body and in spirit. And I love the fact that you're just continuing just to be on, to be greater than, than any words or physical expression could ever be. So I thank you for being here in this service today. And so God, I know that we come with concerns. I know there are so many distractions in our world. Just to, as we're looking left and there's this thing to be concerned about and to be annoyed with, our sense of our freedoms and our distractions and who, the, who is really in charge. Mm -hmm. So God, right now, I just declare that you are in charge. And so in, in spite of the appearance of those who would like to lead us in the direction and fear and war and take over this world, I just call on your love. And I stand in that love that birthed me, that, that birthed all of us, that this created us and surround us. Let us not forget that peace and that love that understanding is. And allow that just to be enough. And on this day, I also just acknowledge that yes, we may pause for a moment and celebrate and acknowledge, yes, Black History Month. But you see, for some of us, a 365-day, 24-7 experience. And it's the American story, and so we just celebrate that. We honor those ancestors who sat and mourned in spite of so many uncomfortable experiences, knowing that one day the truth would come through and come out for liberations. We even bless the life and just thank Mother Tillman, who allowed her son, Emmett Tillman, to be shown after he was killed in an experience so the world could see that experience of what it was like to be beaten and abused with segregation and the racism in the world. But God, what I've come to know in all times, that the truth will eventually come, even as the wife who was the person who supposedly he claimed and whistled and attended to, finally comes to truth today, in this time, in this year, to tell her true story in her heart and recant it. So God, in the midst of so many uncomfortable things as alternate facts, as we go through just alternate truth and place, what I do know, the truth is the truth. There's only one truth. And so in, a, in your time, God, I just know as we are ready to receive it and we're ready to see it, and as we are ready to be your truth, it will come. So I stand in that truth. And so as this church continues to grow stronger and to liberate it, to, to stand in liberation and justice. I know that you will lead this church. I continue to stand on the simple truth. You have not brought us this far to leave us now. I thank you, God, in your many names. Amen. This is the time that we come where Jesus says, set a table. 
And he says to us, it's finished. It's finished. I'm taking care of it. And when he came to the table with his friends in that upper room, he had gone through a lot. He had taken a lot. He turned the other cheek. <laughs> yes. He had made them a little bit different. He was the spirit from the world spirit to show us and teach us. But he took the bread that night when he was at that table and he broke it. And for those who were sitting at the table with him and his father in heaven, he gave thanks for it. He said, this is my body. It is broken for you. And as you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. And in the same like manner, Jesus took the cup and he offered it up to God, his father, our father, your father. He shielded his father. This is my blood that will be poured out for you and for me for the forgiveness of your sin. My sisters and brothers, if you think you're alone, if you think you're suffering, going through things, alone, Jesus says, when you eat the bread, when you drink from the cup, which is for the forgiveness of your sin, just remember me. Dear God, we thank you for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the brokenness of his body, the bread, and the blood for us that he shed. We thank you at Founders MCC Church that Jesus opened this table to all of us, for all of us, for all people. It's a welcome table. It's a celebrating table. It's a table you don't, you don't have to dismiss yourself from. You are good enough. Jesus said it's finished. I've taken care of you. I want you to believe it this morning. And I want you to come and, and share the brokenness of Christ's body with me. And share the shedding of his blood. So you can feel free to share the blessings of his love when you leave here. In order to experience this meal and to prepare for it, I ask that the ushers, the acolytes, and the servers come forward at this time. We want those of you who are our guests today to know that here at Founders MCC, as well as Founders and MCCs all over the world, we celebrate an open communion. You see, you do not need to be a member of this church or any church to receive communion here. You are welcome just as you are. Let me repeat this. You are welcome just as you are. In just a few moments, the ushers will guide you to come forward to communion. Simply, all are welcome.
My friends, as we prepare to leave this space, I first invite you to take a look at the pictures on the back of the wall. It tells the story, our story. It is, from right to left, the history of this congregation. And you'll see that in those pictures, there are challenges and there are hopes. There is joy and there is sorrow. And throughout that story is woven the story of humor and camp in serious fun. (laughs) And so as we leave, may you leave knowing that in you resides the spirit of God's love and the spirit of God's truth. May that love and truth live in you and through you that we begin to create the kind of world that we hope and we imagine. May you rise as you're able for a closing song. Thank you for joining us today. By participating with us online, you are an extension of this church's membership ministry. Wherever you are in the world, we are so excited to embrace you, to hear from you, and to pray for you. Please connect with us and interact with us by telephone, email, or social media. Be an angel amongst us by supporting this ministry through our donation link. With your help, we expand and reach a greater number of people with God's love through this ministry. We invite you to write to us so we can be in prayer and praise with you. You are a part of Founders Metropolitan Community Church. Email us directly, info at mccla.org. May God bless you. Bienvenidos a nuestra programa.